Here we are harvesting some fruits of the Kansaboka tree known as the peanut butter fruit in English. And we're right in the middle of the rainy season. We're in the thick of it now. This is about the 10th day in a row, 10th rainy day in a row. And so we're out here trying to collect some fruit because they might get moldy out here in the rain. The soils out here on our property are ultisols, which is the second most common class of soil in the tropics. And it presents some unique challenges in our situation, which is a degraded cattle pasture. After a few decades of degradation, there's really not much fertility left in the landscape. And right here where I'm standing is an area just below a forest. You can see there's a mature forest right up there and then this whole bottom area where we're standing has been cleared and we get a lot of the runoff water from that forest that filters down through here and this area remains flooded most of the year it's a hydromorphic soil so in this area we've come through and planted a lot of kamu kamu plants and guaje palms because those are adapted to wetter situations and they can actually grow in areas with standing water year round. So those are about the only species that we have planted in this area. There are some little pockets higher up, like where this Kansaboka is and the Guanabana tree there. Those are a little bit higher. The soil is not quite as flooded in these particular spots. This is an example of the siliceous parent materials that actually eroded out of the forest in a recent heavy rain. We tested this material a while back and under a, a total element assay and pretty much uh, all the plant useful elements are low. So this isn't a very useful parent material in terms of building productive soils. Now conventional slash and burn agriculture would be very short sighted to conduct on this forest here based on, on the parent materials because you'd only get a good couple years of cash cropping out of it so it's best to keep it as forest obviously for the biodiversity and environmental reasons as well but it's always a concern because this hillside was actually subjected to a, a landslide last year Here we are in a coffee producing region of the world and you can see that in the forest we've got a lot of volunteer coffee plants that are growing just from the birds. That indicates that with the forest there's a reduction in aluminum toxicity probably just through the recycling of the organic matter and the buildup of organic matter. Because coffee is a species that is sensitive to aluminum toxicity. So this is potassium iodate, which is the most stable form of iodine. And so we don't have to worry about it breaking down just because of the heat and humidity here in the tropics. Due to the relative inaccessibility of our land, we try to fertilize our plants with nutrients that are only required in minute quantities and this isn't even an essential plant nutrient it's a beneficial nutrient iodine so we're just trying to give each of our specimen fruit trees on the property 50 milligrams of iodine so i just add five milliliters per plant which is equivalent to 50 milligrams per plant and try and get it on the foliage a little bit well, in our context, since this is a relatively inaccessible property, it makes sense for us to do all we can with micronutrients because those are only, we only need small quantities of those. Whereas if we wanted to add dolomite to the property in order to lime the soil, we would be adding multiple tons of a material every year. And that would be, that would require a lot of manual labor and be very time consuming. Whereas something like this is lightweight, we can just put our solution in a fanny pack 
and walk around the property I'm just adding 50 milligrams per plant there's not a lot of research that's been done on iodine applications but some studies have shown up to a 10% increase in yield just with the addition of iodine versus control and in our case uh, we're doing it mostly as an experiment because it's, been, it's also been shown to increase the plant's tolerance to salt and other stressors so we want it for the abiotic and biotic stress resistance aspects so in this case it might be beneficial for the plant to help resist the aluminum toxicity of the subsoil of these ultisols we haven't done very much here to add fertility mainly we are just trickling fertility back into the soil via the manure of these chicken tractors as they pass through the landscape you can see this is the pathway where we've ran them through we've added small amounts of biogenic phosphate rock a little bit of dolomite up only about one ton per hectare which is almost irrelevant in this context we have highly toxic aluminum subsoils and you can see there is a little difference between the upslope areas and the downslope areas down here you can see because of the erosion from upslope you end up with a lot less fertility and that's a situation exacerbated obviously by the steepness of the slope and a lot of that nutrient ends up down here in these flatter areas and you have to be careful in a lot of the agroforestry circles nowadays people will make recommendations about you should plant this species to create more biomass or that species and often the advice is based on their own context and it might not work outside of the context perhaps um, you might try and plant a Mexican sunflower and it doesn't work so I would rather just work with the weeds that are already here this is a, a Calipagonium mucunoides vine which is a nitrogen fixing forage species and it's doing really well here these are soils with uh, very low nutrient capital reserves so basically anything that we've uh, got on this property that's already successful is what we're going to favor and we've tried to plant other things like the erythrina which is successful on some other areas of the property but in certain areas like down here it just doesn't grow and so that's a common thing that people would recommend as a biomass producing species that will help um, improve your soil but it won't grow here in this particular spot so what we do have is the calipagonium and um, these aguaje palms as you can see are very common down here this whole area is wet year-round so there's a lot of uh, iron toxicity as well as aluminum toxicity and pretty much the aguajes are one of the only species that can tolerate that recently we added a couple kilos per plant of gypsum calcium sulfate and we added that to some of the species that are more susceptible to aluminum toxicity like these avocados for example gypsum doesn't help correct the acidity but it helps protect the root tips from the aluminum ions in general the subsoil on this property besides being aluminum toxic is also very low in key plant nutrients it was actually extremely low when we tested in total potassium if you took the amount of total potassium that was analyzed and made 100% of that total potassium plant available it would still be a low amount of available plant potassium so there's really nothing for reserve for the plants so in a lot of these spots of the property like up there where the chicken tractors are it's more of a what you fertilize is what you get context 
down here we've had the tractors a few times and we're starting to build up more fertility you can see right here there's actually some corn plants from some corn that the chickens missed there's even little mangoes that are sprouting up we like to give them our kitchen scraps so they add the fertility they clear out the weeds and most of their manure goes right into these trees like this is a nice palio here and then we've got as i was saying a lot of different native weeds and all we do is come through and what's already growing in terms of weeds like this shilka plant right here we just mow it down a couple times a year and that goes right back into the soil and then we've got the african brachiardia species this is a nitrogen fixing grass that's what they use all over here for their cattle so these brachiardia grasses are capable of fixing up to about 20 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare but to only grow in areas with sufficient drainage this is about the limit to where they'll grow any further down the hill the soil gets a little bit too soggy and they stop growing so we see these more up on the upper slopes of the property before we mow an area we like to cast cowpea seeds by hand because cowpea is one of the only crop species that you can grow in very acidic soil and it's a good edible plant nitrogen fixing forage and we can actually mow it back in again right before it flowers just to add more nitrogen into the landscape so that's what we've done in this area this is one of the most low-lying areas on the entire property which means almost year round there's standing water so we planted this area to aguaje palms and right here in the middle there's a little island that's slightly higher than the rest of the landscape so we planted the ice cream bean trees here there's even a caimito right there and a little mango tree there and i recently came through here and pollarded all of these ice cream bean trees dropped them onto the ground there because i wanted to give more light to all the aguaje palms so now the aguaje palms have all the water and all the light that they want and they're starting to grow a lot better here's a guanabana tree too that's benefiting from the light now and the constant moisture Probably the only saving grace for this kind of soil is its anion exchange capacity. In general, the site is pretty infertile and will require quite a few inputs. However, there's some potential in the flatter areas, and we've also tested other parts of the landscape that have no aluminum toxicity whatsoever. In any case, I believe that success for a project is based 40% on species selection, 40% on direct seeding, and only 20% on management.